Good morning from Vietnam, Lacey. Thanks a lot for spending your afternoon joining our inside sharing show and sharing your stories with our global audience. And on behalf of the listeners, I want to say thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm so thrilled to be joining today. Hey, uh, have you been to Vietnam before? I have not. I have not. It's on the list, though. Yeah, so if you have a new friend now, so new family, new friend. If you travel here, you let us know, and I will make sure that perfect. Have you? Huh? Yeah, have you been out to LA? Yeah, yeah. I used to live. I used to live in San Francisco. So I've been to LA uh, a, f- a few times. Then I moved to Seattle in 2002, 2003, and I left the States in 2011 and reside in, in Asia ever since. Excellent, excellent. Well, next time you're here, let me know and we'll grab some coffee. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be in the States in February and LA is one of the destinations I'm going to travel. I'll let you know in advance. So if you're around, then I'll invite you for a cup of coffee together. Right? Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> And in, in our culture, Liz, it's, it's an honor for us to have uh, you, know, you to do a little introduction about who you are and the work that you do. Could you do that for us? Absolutely. Um, so thank you for that introduction. I'm Lacey Leone McLaughlin. I'm an executive coach and um, a human capital practitioner. I spend my time working with individual leaders, teams, and organizations, really helping maximize and capitalize on the great work people, teams, and organizations do. Mm, well, you know, you have a years of experience with a beautiful journey, but you introduce all your works and yourself in less than 30 seconds. So, well. gonna, <laughs> so let's say this conversation, we're going to dive in uh, deeper to get to know, you know, your aspiration, your inspirations, and your mo- motivation working with people. Yes. Is it okay? Yeah, that sounds great. Alrighty. So I think this uh, everything. Uh, let's start from uh, you know when we were young, and uh, so let's travel time. When I was young, I always wanted to become a uh, an astronaut. So travel a different you know in space and and jumping different planet seems so cool to me. But uh, life didn't give me any chance doing any works closer to that. So um, and it took me to a very different path from what I wanted to be. So when you was young. What was your dream about your future, Bill? Yeah, so there were two things that I really wanted to do when I was young, and they're very, very different in the spectrum. Yeah. Um, one was I wanted to be a politician, ah. and the other was I wanted to be like a disc jockey um, or voice actor, somebody that read something or somebody that interviewed people, but really sort of just had fun um, with voice and um, engaging with people through interview and. Um, laughter and content and, and all that good stuff. Ah, so one is become a politician and then second is uh, or becoming a DJ. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you know, it's interesting and they probably have more similarities than I recognized at the time mm-hmm. and I think they both feed what I do right now um, pretty well. So, you know, when you think about um, a politician that is in service of their community. Mm. So I really wanted to get out, help move people forward. I wanted to be in service of others. Mm. And when I think about the um, the skills and the disc jockeys and the DJs that I connected with or the people that were doing some sort of interviews or things to that extent, it was the people that were driving impact through conversation. Mm. So when I think about both of those things and I think about the work that I do as an executive coach and a uh, leadership development professional, I'm doing both of those things just in a very, very different way. Uh-huh. And I actually didn't connect the dots to that until you know the last couple of years when I thought, gosh, when I was a kid, what did I want to do? Uh-huh. You know what? What are the skills associated with both of those jobs? You know, today I'm actually doing those things, maybe not in the two professions that I thought it would be in or wanted it to be in, but very much in the same way. Um, As an executive coach, I spend my time working with leaders, helping them be their best, helping in service of organizations, communities, and people. And then um, as sort of a DJ and somebody who's doing interviews, having the opportunity to help people smile, connect, and to bring meaning into things, uh, which I do in my work today as well. So I think I have the best of both worlds. <laughs> see, and it's amazing. Yeah, it's so exciting to see life going full circle, right? All the dogs being connected back. What that to, you know, what you've been dreaming when you was, uh, you know, a young little girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's so funny when I look back because both of those things sound substantially less fun than what I do today. <laughs> Let's see. I wanna I wanna explore from a a 
the two dreams a DJ and, and a politicians then you have you know get into what you are doing now that there, there must be you know a path in between so tell us how that path leading to what you are doing now yeah uh, completely unintentionally mm. so I, I actually did go to school my undergraduate is in political science um, and thought I was going to again spend my time in service in some capacity um, had some opportunities in that space and ended up ultimately going more of a business route, which which I uh, I still stand behind completely, but ultimately fell into the development space, fell into the leadership and the training space um, through connections I had through my network and ultimately had no idea what it was. But there was a company, there was a firm that does this work and they had amazing thought leaders, like really brilliant thought leaders. Um, that were having a hard time in the marketplace of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. connecting their thought leadership to business people. And this really amazing woman, her name was Diane Marantet, reached out to me, um, a couple of recruiters reached out to me and they're like, we want to invest, we want to spend time, we want to teach somebody that speaks the language of business, HR, human capital, and development. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what the heck is that? Uh, I came up to LA, I went through a full week of assessments and ultimately was offered this job and took the job Still having absolutely no idea what it was. Like uh, it was a, a assessment and multi rater and coaching and development and training. And I'm like, I, I have no idea what this is. Um, but it sounded intriguing. The people were great. So I moved from San Diego to Los Angeles and started uh, on this journey of this work. And luckily fell in love with it right away, mm. had amazing leaders and mentors, um, and have never looked back. So I've been doing it for over 20 years, um, and I've worked with some of the most amazing thought leaders in the space, the Jay Galbraiths and the Ed Lawlers and the John Boudreaux and the Ian Ziskins and the Marshall Goldsmiths and the David Peterson. I've been trained and worked with and worked around the very, very best, mm. which again, um, just hugely lucky. And um, I've had an opportunity to work with amazing clients and doing amazing work. So I've never, never looked back. And it all started just as a, a fluke opportunity of a company wanting to take a different path and how they thought about developing their internal talent, which ultimately was me. And um, it was a really great decision. And I'm glad I, I'm glad I made it. <laughs> did you ever ask, you know, um, why did, you know, what's her name that called you earlier? Diane? Diane, Diane Meritet, yeah. Okay. And then did you ask did you ask her why did she call you back then? If she didn't call, then your life you may be taken to a totally different path yeah. already, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. There's a couple of funny stories around that. So uh -huh. after I took the job, I called the, co the company headquarters, where, which were in Minnesota, Minneapolis, actually Twin Cities. Uh, and I called, and this was before you could get online and Google something really easy and company websites would pop up. So I Googled, and there's a couple of things about the company. And this is after I already took the job, negotiated salary, was moving to Los Angeles. And I called company headquarters, and I'm like, hey, potential client, uh, help me understand what this firm does. <laughs> and it was just so hard to get a sense of, of what all of the work in human capital actually was. Mm -hmm. um, and then I did have a conversation with Diane and was like, listen, I was a political science major. I had absolutely uh, no understanding of this space, no skills in this space. You know, why me, why then? <sighs> um, and she said, well, when you and I, and when you and the rest of the team sat and connected, you listened you were interested in learning and you gave a damn about the people you were talking with. And all of that transitioned quite nicely to what she thought the job and the opportunity would be. Mm -hmm. um, and all of those things are pretty evident in my, my work today. You know, I listen, I care, and, and um, I'm wanting to move you know, people forward. Wow, wow, beautiful. So so listening seems to be one of the, you know, the, the key criteria that you've been selected for, for this, right? And then make, your career as successful also so we're gonna get into that part later on in the conversation I want to know from that point you know when you got into a career in HR that you know nothing about just the interest of that and then how the journey took place after that yeah yeah so um, at the beginning it was 
just learning, right? Wow. It was learning and understanding what are the parts of the business that I wanted to be involved in. So um, the firm was Personnel Decisions International, PDI, and now they're a part of Corn Ferry. Wow. Um, but back in the day, they were a large human capital consulting firm uh, that was a standalone shop. Hmm. So, I, you know, I think those first couple of months was just listening and learning and understanding the different parts of the business. What does leadership development look like from a training and course perspective, an education perspective? What does leadership and development look like from an assessment perspective, multi-rater, 360s, uh, executive assessment, that kind of thing? And what does leadership development look like from an executive coaching perspective? Mm -hmm. um, for me, right away, I went to the executive coaching and I went to the leadership development and training and learning and education side. So I spent about seven years in that business running um, some pretty large teams around some pretty large organizations, cutting my teeth in aerospace and automotive, working with technically functionally brilliant leaders yeah. who were then in charge of managing a lot of people and that's a completely different skill set. So I spent a lot of time working with functionally technically brilliant people uh, and then ultimately, because I'm here in LA, because I'm here next to Hollywood, started spending a lot of time with people in the film, entertainment, and media space uh, in the same way, functionally, technically brilliant producers, directors, actors, writers, showrunners um, that were struggling in the same way. Technically brilliant, now they're in charge of a show, or now they're bringing a movie to life, or a docuseries, or something to that extent, and managing huge budgets huge amounts of teams um, and really doing a lot of work. So my time at PDI was just listening, learning, connecting, working with leaders. Mm -hmm. And then I transitioned um, after about seven or eight years, horrible with dates and time, so don't hold me to it. Uh, but after about seven or eight years, I transitioned to the University of Southern California and um, was in charge of the consulting services for the Center for Effective Organizations, and that's at the Marshall School of Business. So Ed Lawler was the founder of the center, and he was the director of research. I took that research in the human capital space, turned it into opportunities for learning and development. Uh -huh. And luckily, uh, for those 10 years, I had the opportunity to run my own consulting practice. So everything I did at the Marshall School of Business was big work design, large change initiatives, uh, transformation, and then everything I did in my own business was focused on the team, focused on the individual, or focused on a small group of people within an organization. So really, the best of both worlds. Um, I ran that piece of the business for 10 years, and then left to co-found um, an HR tech startup, really thinking about how we democratize executive coaching to bring it to early career professionals mm. um, and college students. So I did all the things you do in an HR tech startup. I raised a bunch of money. I created a team. I put an app, a beta in the market, and I had customers. So I did that for a little over two years. Um, had all of those things in place when I decided it was time for me to transition back out and then transitioned back out to my business, which I had always kept moving because it was the, the functionality that was feeding the app. How I worked with clients was how we used the AI mm -hmm. to feed the app. And um, for the last three years, I've been working on my business only. And it's the first time ever I've only had one job. Mm -hmm. There's no side hustle. <laughs> hey, uh, let me see. I, I have a question about running businesses, right? So yeah. It's not easy. Uh, it's not easy to be an, an, an entrepreneur then you know what you have when you've been in in other settings you have everything covered you know you're very comfortable you know like a lot of people a lot of executive friends of mine by the time they retire they they share with us two things that uh, that normally they regret not doing earlier and one of the two is not to start their own company when they were younger right and along the way you've been starting your business and then now you've been running your solo business without any other <laughs> any 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 other uh, things doing beside you know your own company that's dangerous that, that's scary to a lot of people i mean so uh what did you tell to yourself to leave all the comfortability aside and then you know went on to the wiring world and then enjoy the business yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So I actually founded my company in 2008, uh -huh. so it's been a long time now, and I've made it through a couple of downturns. I've made it through COVID. Um, you know, I've, I've had I've had a pretty good run. Um, 
you know, I think for me, focusing specifically on the business and, and you know, I guess my definition of side hustle is a little bit different than everybody else's because I am, you know, the host of a podcast as well, and I have partnered and collaborated with several other organizations and, and leaders, so I guess there are several different things that I do, but that's just standard and norm for me, but I think specifically when you think about my consulting business, um, you know, it's doing the work that I want to do mm-hmm. with the people that I want to do it with in the way that I want to, right, and, and really being able to own my time and focus in the places that I think have the most value uh, is really the inspiration and what got me to the place of making that leap. Um, and then really understanding that I love what I do and I need to be confident in the skills I bring to the table. And if I do the things that I know how to do really well, mm-hmm. the business side, you know, it just sort of works out. And it was scary and it was very scary at first. And it was scary when I started the company in 2008. And I did. I had the the safety blanket of the work that I was doing at the Center for Effective Organizations. And it was scary when I left CEO of the Center for Effective Organizations to start the HR tech startup. Um, And it was scary when I left that to go back to doing the consulting work full time. Um, And I'll even say, heck, it was scary when I started the podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Is anybody going to listen? Is anybody going to watch? Does anybody care? Um, so all of the things that I find most rewarding in life were a little intimidating, took a little time, and I had to kind of get out of my own way to make it happen, to recognize the benefits of it. And, and now, truthfully, I, um, I work with the best clients that do the best, most engaging, you know, empowering, fun at work um, in the time that works for me and my family. Wow. Lacey, I, I want to ask um about the message that you talk to yourself. You know, it's good, you know, when, when, when we are doing well, then, you know, the message seems to be different. But then when we're not doing so well, what message did you talk to yourself to give you the courage, the strength to continue with your path? Yeah, you know, I think for me, anytime that it hasn't gone well, and believe me, there's, there's been a lot of those times, right? Um, and even when it's going well from a business perspective, you know, bringing on teammates hasn't gone well, or even when it's going well from a revenue perspective, maybe enjoying the work that I'm doing hasn't gone as well. Um, but ultimately, whatever that challenge has been, you know, it's really just been, um, you know how to get to the other side, mm. have faith and confidence in the choices that you made, mm. and ultimately, uh, it will work out. So it's stay the course, trust and believe that you're on the right path and you're making the right decisions mm. and focus on doing the things that get you to the other side, which mm. has worked quite well for me. <laughs> Let's see. I think so, that's just grit, right? You just gotta be tough. <laughs> As a business owner and entrepreneur, you just gotta be tough. It's just grit. Yeah. I think the word trust is very important. Trusting ourselves is very important when we're going on, you know, on our path as an entrepreneur, right? So uh, and then the trust is, is something that is intangible. It's not something that I can see, you can see. It's just a good feelings from within, right? So how do you turn the trust onto something that can help you be motivating, more inspiring for you? Though? Yeah, so for me, it's all about intentionality. Intentionality. Right? So if, yeah, so if something in the business isn't working, how do I get really intentional about figuring out what it is and what are the actions I'm gonna take to make a change? If there's a piece of the business that I'm less energized by, taking the time, being intentional to figure out what part of that portfolio isn't working for me mm-hmm. and what am I going to do differently. So for me, trust is about slowing down, resetting, and being intentional about what isn't working mm-hmm. and what are the steps I'm going to take to, to right the ship. Mm-hmm. And earlier we mentioned about the words listening, right? So uh, mm-hmm. you was you were the new kid on the block years ago, getting to the HR advisory, uh, uh, HR, you know, human capital consultant, right? And uh, so you listen to the message, you listen to the the the, the advices from other people, you listen to you know how people teach you to become getting better at what at, at that industry, and. Now, now you listen to your own self, the trust, the intuition uh, within yourself, right? So how do you develop the listening, you know, yeah. long ago? Yeah, it, it's a good question. So again, I go back to how much of a gift the mentors and the leaders and the thought leaders in my life have been for mm-hmm. me. So, you know, for me, it's really around accountability, 
Mm-hmm. I've had really, really amazing leaders. Again, and Diane Marentet, um, Ian Ziskin, Jay Conger, Ed Lawler, all of these people in my life that have held me accountable to a standard, who have held me accountable to understanding the value that I add, the client work that I want to deliver, uh, the way I want to engage in business, and um, have helped me build the muscle around it. Mm. So when I think about trust and listening, you know, it's that muscle memory that says, hey, if something's not going right in the business or something's not um, shaping up in the way that I want it to, Mm. how do I get intentional? How do I trust how do I take some time and hold myself accountable to the decisions that I've make, been making or I'm going to make? Um, and it's the muscle memory and the really, really good development that these people who have spent years investing in me and training and developing me um, taught me early on in my career that stick with me today. Beautiful, beautiful. And uh, you were listening to how the leadership related to executive coaching, you were listening to how the leadership related to, to the space of talent development and stuff, and, and, and in the space of assessment also, right? Mm-hmm. So why you decided to evolve all to become an executive coach and working with leaders to help them get better, and, you know? Yeah, yeah. So the honest answer is it energizes the heck out of me. Uh-huh. So I love working with leaders. I love working with teams in a very real way. Um, so there is nothing more exciting than sitting across the table from a leader talking about the business, helping them identify what's not working or what they want to work a little bit differently, mm-hmm. and then asking good questions and helping them think about what are the changes they're going to make in their business tomorrow to do something differently and yield the results that they're looking for. Um, So ultimately it was a no brainer for me. I wanted to work with people. Uh, The executive coaching work is probably the best way to do that. And the training work is the best way to do that. And I was all in from day one. (laughs) Let's see. Earlier you mentioned that those leaders are amazing, talented people, really, really good at what they are doing, right? And the, mm-hmm. the technical side. And uh, so uh, a normal a normal feelings for people when they come to work with those leaders that we scare and we feel like, oh, okay, who we are to work with them, who we are to help them, who we are to, to, to think that we can make them getting better. So what was the secret sauce you know, from lazy that that tells you that, uh, that that you will be capable of helping them to become even more effective and better leaders. Yeah. So no secret sauce, and the reality is, it's not really about me, right? Uh-huh. It's about it goes back again to those those first couple of years in this space. It's about listening, mm. and it's about caring, right? And giving a damn. Um, so it's the ability to ask really good questions. It's the ability to help people think differently. Mm-hmm. And it's the ability to connect with people in a way that um, they trust and allow you to take them on this journey, right? So so for me, whole, it, whole heck of a lot less about me um, and more about them and the way that I show up that helps them be the best. Mm. And then executive coaching has been in space uh, in in the industry for a long time, not and and it's been evolving a lot. But uh, in in certain country, it's still in early stage, and a lot of leaders still be, don't believe that executive coaching will help them to get better. So uh, mm-hmm. and uh, and what message would you share with those leaders? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the reality is, is leadership is hard and it's only getting harder, mm. right? So if you think about the way you develop, whether it's finances or marketing or any other aspect of people, or even just putting a strategic plan together, all of those things, you spend time learning, listening, developing, mm. managing people and being the leader, the same side of the same kind of muscle memory, the same kind of practice, the same sort of development, um, is necessary and is used. So I would say just like anything else a leader wants to get good at, managing people, leading a business, same thing. But I'd argue that it's probably even more imperative because if you do it wrong, the risks of the business are substantially higher than if you blow a presentation or you get the marketing numbers wrong or, you you know, I mean, you lose people, you lose talent, you lose opportunity Mm -hmm. when you're not utilizing the leaders that you have within an organization. So my, uh, my, my conversation with those people is every part of the business you develop, 
why would leadership, why would the way you show up be any different? Ah, beautiful. And how do they respond normally? <laughs> normally they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So then what do we do? <laughs> and, then, and then we go into a conversation. Well, it's just help me understand what's going on in your business. Mm -hmm. What's working? Mm -hmm. What's not? And then we go from there. Wow. I know the years you've been in this space, I was like coaching for for like 14 years already. It's a long time, right? And well, it's still probably, it's probably closer to 20. It's crazy. It's probably closer to 20. So wow. I think I started my first coaching client in 2002. Oh, like 20 years, 21 years ago already. Mm -hmm. So Lacey, mm -hmm. uh, Oh, oh the, when the people come to you for, for executive coach, right? So what is a common thing that, that they need help developing with them? Yeah, um, there's a couple of different things. I think that right now with everything going on in the world, pandemic, remote working, social issues, right now uh, leaders are coming to me just sort of understanding and thinking through how they show up mm -hmm. and how they manage through all of this change, right? Change is just a key theme in general right now in the work environment. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big one. Um, you know, another really large one that I hear from people that they really want to focus on is how do they think about you know, their leadership, growing the talent within their organization mm -hmm. and making sure that they're building a group of people behind them that can mm -hmm. do really, really good work. And ultimately that leads to them you know, managing their time, managing their responsibilities a little bit better. Mm, wow. Thanks for sharing that. And then for 20 years in executive coaching, I know that there's a lot of people now who want to get in to become a, a executive coach. So uh, we want to pick your brain on that. So if somebody wants to be become an effective executive coach, what skills do they need to learn and master now? Yeah, yeah, you know, there's a lot of really great certificates out there. There's a lot of ways to go get uh, a foundation and an education around what this work needs to look like. So I think first it's about what kind of leaders do you want to work with and what kind of work do you want to do? And then the second is, you know, do I have the skills? Do I have the ability to ask questions, listen, learn, help people work through things in a structured way? Do I have the tools in my toolkit to do that? And then ultimately it goes back to one of your earlier questions. Do I uh, know how I'm thinking about running a sustainable business where I have the ability to coach as a profession? So I think there's the skills piece, mm -hmm. where you want to partner, where you want to do work, and then ultimately how do you make it sustainable? How do you think about um, the business side of it and you know, keeping your doors open and uh, food on the table? <laughs> yeah, when you say keeping the door open, I, it reminds me about... Um, your conversation with Diane long ago, you know, and then you mentioned, I uh, note that here's a few key words that it's about listening, it's about learning, it's about developing, didn't give a damn about, you know, uh, and, then, and then you work very proactively in calling and asking, right? So if you really, if you really look at your career and, you know, what make you, you know, and tell us, what did you think that is, the secret to your success though, besides those things. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, going back to the grit, right? Like it's the ability to just figure it out and get it done. So there's been some really big career pivot points in mm. my, my journey. And ultimately, those all came with a lot of risk and my willingness to sort of jump in and say, I don't really know what this is going to look like or if I'm going to have success or how what success looks like. But you know what? I'm pretty confident that I'm going to figure it out. Uh, uh, has opened the door for me in so many ways, right? So it's just the ability to persevere, the ability to get things done, and the willingness to want to do it. Beautiful, beautiful. And I have two last questions for our conversation today, all right? Related to the figure it out, uh, the answer that you mentioned earlier. Uh, my wife and I, we've been on the quest to help people to improve their ability to think because we believe that our thinking capability these days has been diminishing. So every chance that we can ask experts to share their ways of thinking, we hope that our listeners will be able to pick something up for them to reflect, to learn and to make change in their, their, their life. And, and the thinking is the is a big part in figuring things out, right? So uh, 
how have you been expand your ability to think over the years, Lacey? Yeah, for me, it's just the ability to ask questions. Mm. So ultimately, I, I think, I think I think, um, <laughs> I have the ability, you know, I think, um, and I have the ability to process and think critically because I ask questions mm. with the intention of wanting to learn, uh -huh. right? So I think so often people ask questions or they speak because they want to be heard. Mm. And I think somebody who does the opposite, which is ask questions because they want to listen and learn, mm. really, really impacts our ability to think critically. So that is a huge one for me. I want to hear, I want to ask questions, and I want to listen mm. so I can come to my own conclusions, so I can think critically, and so I can develop myself and the people that I work with. Yeah. And, uh, and that leading to one additional question that I didn't intend, you know, plan. <laughs> so I, I want to ask you for this. When you said that you listen with the intention to learn, and why a lot of other people will listen uh, and ask questions with the intention so that they can be heard, right? So um, how do you build that, you know, like ability to to ask questions and have the full intention to learn instead of, you know, like letting your message across? Yeah, yeah. So the intentionality there mm. is about really listening. Mm. So we have to train ourselves when we ask a question and somebody's talking, not to think about what we're going to say next, uh. not to think about how they poke holes and what that person is saying is right or wrong, mm. but ultimately what is the follow on question that I'm going to ask mm. so I can hear more. Mm. So that makes sense? That seems very simple, but in practice, it's really, really hard because in conversation, like you and I, we, we don't have a list of questions in advance, right? So it's a spontaneous. A lot of us in the conversation in our daily time, we always, you know, talk in, in uh, simultaneous also. So how can we practice in a sense that we're asking, but not prepare, we're asking questions to, to get the conversation more exciting, but not to prepare for the next question? set of questions now? Yeah, yeah, it, it's just practice. It's just practice. You catch yourself. You catch yourself. Am I really listening right now? Uh, Do I hear what this person is saying? Do I want to know more? What is it that I want to know more? Rather than saying, mm, what he's saying is right. What he's saying is wrong. Here's how I would say it differently. Instead, it's, you know, my question back to you would be like, you know, so you and your wife have been doing this and you're focused on you're focused on learning and thinking critically. How's that going for you? I think that... Uh, so that's, that's where we go with that. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for, you know, sharing the tips and asking me back that questions. So that it shows that you're listening and have intention to, you know, to, uh, to listen, right? Let's see. I want to go to the last question. Okay, so we knew a young version of Lacey that wanted to become a politician and or a DJ, right? And then you went on to a, a study political science and but not getting to the politician world, but getting to the, the human resource world and working with leaders, working with, uh, you know, human capital uh, industry, right? And life came in circle for you, you know, you know, you you serving others, and it's that is fulfilling part of the politicians, right? And then the DJ part where you get people into the conversation with energies, with with motivation, with a lot of and you know, like uh, inspirations. And we want to get into the future a little bit. Is there anything that you are working on that is exciting? you want to share with me and the audience so we can celebrate with you in advance. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for asking. So my, the first season of my podcast, uh, podcast unfolding leadership came out, it did quite well. Mm. So, um, I'm in the process of thinking through a second season and what are the stories and the unfolding journeys of the leaders that I work with mm. and how does that take place? And then ultimately, that first season led me to sign on to, to start a book on these yeah. topics. So I'm in the process of sharing leadership journeys and stories and lessons learned and bumped and bumps and bruises that I have learned from the leaders that I work with that hopefully will have a pretty big impact of the lead on the leaders of tomorrow. So that's uh, underway and season two of the podcast is underway and both of those things 
have high risk, they make me nervous, and i'm doing them both, just like we talked about ah in our conversation. so i'm excited and a little apprehensive um but really thrilled to see where they both go. well, and i i congratulate you in advance for making making those big achievements. okay, so let me know when the book is is ah is releasing and so that we can send you know big congratulations to you and and we ordered the books for our audience also. okay? Uh, thank you. It's early, early stages. Just work through a table of contents and it's early stages. So I'll keep you posted, but uh, don't expect anything too soon. This is new to me. <laughs> <laughs> that will be a wonderful uh, journey for you. And, you know, it's, it's a very different experience and you're going to love it. You know, it's all inside of you already, Lacey, so get it out, all right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much for being so generous, joining my show and sharing your stories with our audience. And a lot of good tips, a lot of you know, you know, amazing thing that you share, and um, and I want to say thank you. I wish you well. I, happy New Year to you, and I hope to see you in person for a cup of coffee one day. <laughs>